Today's episode is brought to you by the U.S. Bank Altitude Connect Visa Signature Card. To learn more, visit usbank.com slash Altitude Connect. Now, let's get into the show. Hey there, it's Jason here with ZeroToTravel.com. Happy New Year, my friends. And I thought, what better way to get the New Year started right for a traveler like yourself than to give you an incredible list of destinations to get you inspired to hit the road. This one, provided by none other than National Geographic, they recently unveiled their annual Best of the World list, which includes 25 must-see destinations broken down into five categories. They've got family, adventure, culture, nature, and community, which is a new one. And in this episode today, you'll hear from the senior editor for National Geographic Traveler, Amy Olipio, who shares her five favorites, one from each category. Along the way, you'll get some tasty travel tidbits about each destination. Sure to get you fired up to hit the road. And just to give you a little sneak peek here, I always love to discover lesser known but equally as breathtaking alternatives to those ultra famous and therefore ultra crowded attractions. Amy shares one of those today, as you'll hear in this clip. Machu Picchu is kind of being loved to death. And here's a place that has similar amazing things about it and is much, much less visited. I was so excited to learn about that spot and discover more of these destinations through this interview. I'm sure you're going to dig it. But beyond the destinations, I want all writers out there listening, photographers, really anyone who has ever dreamed of getting their work featured in National Geographic to listen up because it's not every day I get to get on a call with the senior editor of National Geographic Traveler. So I had to ask her, how can you get your pitch noticed at National Geographic? How can you stand out from the other thousands of emails that she gets? You're not going to want to miss her answers to those questions. You got all of that today and much more. Plus, with this episode of the Zero to Travel podcast, we have officially entered our 10th year of production. It's crazy. I'll share a listener voicemail that I think sums up what this show has been all about better than I can sum it up, as well as a few choice memories from when the show began, a little bit of the good, the bad, and the ugly, all of that happening right now in this show. So buckle up, strap in. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the new year and welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. Listening to the Zero to Travel podcast, where we explore exciting travel based work, lifestyle, and business opportunities, helping you to achieve your wildest travel dreams. And now, your host, world wanderer and travel junkie, Jason Moore. Hey, what's up? It's Jason here with ZeroToTravel.com. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for hanging out, letting me bring a little travel into your ears today. This is the show to help you travel the world on your terms to fill your life. With as much travel as you desire, no matter what your situation or experience, I am beyond thrilled to have you here listening, joining the rest of the community from around the world today, and to talk destinations. In fact, I've decided this entire month is going to be a destination-themed month. Heavy destination focus. Why not start the new year, right? Every traveler out there loves to hear about new destinations, discover new places, myself included, and I thought January of a new year, great way to kind of get us going, get our travel juices flowing, and we're going to focus on a wide range of travel styles in some of the upcoming episodes, going to share some of the best destinations for longer-term travelers, remote workers, nomads, as well as some amazing spots for travelers taking Shorter trips, we're going to do a deep dive on Norway coming up, we're going to hit Japan, plenty of awesome stuff. So subscribe to the show if you haven't done so yet, and also sign up over at zerototravel.com, going to be setting up some community calls and workshops in the coming year. So if you want to get on the list and you don't want to miss the stuff that's happening off the podcast and in the community, then you can sign up over there, it's totally free. I'm so excited to kick off our destination-themed month with none other than the senior editor for National Geographic Travel, Amy Olipio. She has curated a list within a list, so to speak. She picks her five favorites from the 
National Geographic yearly best of the world list. By the way, I'll link to that in the show notes. You can find it at natgeo.com slash best of the world. The entire list contains 25 breathtaking places and experiences for 2023. So if you're looking for your next adventure, be sure to check that out. But I would suggest not peeking, even though that link might be right below you on your smartphone or your laptop. If you want to be surprised, you can listen to the show and check it out afterwards. And don't forget to stick around on the back end. If you're curious, I'm going to give a shout out to a listener who is planning a trip to one of my favorite all-time destinations. Plus, I want to share a few choice thoughts and memories on being in the 10th year of production here on this show, the Zero to Travel podcast. All of that coming up after the interview. One last thing I should mention to celebrate going into the 10th year of production here. We've got a sale going on over at zerototravel.com slash premium. That's where you can get access to a private Zero to Travel podcast ad-free feed. You'll get exclusive content I've never published here on this show, plus bonus episodes each month. So you're going to get almost two years of bonus episodes and the entire archives, hundreds of shows. So if you like the content here, you want more, you want to support the show, you can get 50% off the lifetime access package. 50% off through January 10th over at zerototravel.com slash premium. So if you've been thinking about joining the premium passport community there or just wanted to support the show, now's a great chance to get hundreds of shows from the archives the bonus episodes, and more at zerototravel.com slash premium. That's going to be 50% off the lifetime access package. And look forward to welcoming you in there. Thanks for listening. Now let's slip and slide into my conversation with Amy. I'll see you on the other side, my friend. I saw on your Twitter, because I was uh, preparing for this interview, that you're a dessert eater. So I, I actually just wanted to ask you uh, what kind of desserts you like. <laughs> you know, a- anything really, because I always like struggle between the chocolate or the fruit dessert, like where you have that option. So it's really, I kind of go back and forth. I really will eat any dessert, like <laughs> ice cream, cakes, any kind of dessert. Yeah. I always believe that there is a hierarchy of dessert needs. So ice cream is at the top of mine, and then it's cookies. Cake <laughs> is kind of last, which kind really? of upsets my family here because there's a big cake culture in Norway. Okay. They like their cakes. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> what? what's the thing to dessert to eat when I'm in Norway? Where I've well, never been? that's a loaded question. Research. Not the not the one I'm drinking right now, which is my pathetic pre-interview dessert. It's an instant coffee with chocolate sauce <laughs> put in. Hershey's chocolate sauce, because I found that here, which was always sweet. You know, when you're abroad, you you search out these American things that aren't so special on the yeah. on the shelves at home, but then when you see them abroad, it's like finding a bar of gold or something. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Are you from Canada? No, um, I just went to school in Canada. Okay. How did yeah. that go down? Where did you, where are you from? I'm from DC. I'm from here um, where Nat Geo is. So I'm, you know, born in DC, grew up in right outside in Maryland. Um, but went to school um, abroad because it was cheaper, frankly. <laughs> Although I did start out in the States. I, I went to um, Oberlin first in Ohio, outside Cleveland. And then um, in my junior year, I did a junior year abroad at the University of Sussex in Brighton, England, and just like really loved it so much, um, that whole international living thing. And I decided to switch all my credits to University of Sussex. So I actually graduated from University of Sussex, and then, um, and then it was also cheaper. And then I did my master's at Carleton University in Ottawa, and my journalism master's, yeah, and um, what did the study abroad experience teach you? Oh, my God. Well, that is really because, you know, I've always been a traveler, but it really wasn't till I lived there that the whole like perspective shift happened where you don't feel like, you know, you're kind of your U.S. centric 
bias that even when you're traveling, kind of when you're a young person, you still think the U.S. is the center of the universe. But it wasn't until you lived abroad and I was, you know, the University of Sussex was so international. I mean, I had a group of friends that was like a guy from Iraq, a guy from Iran, a woman from Spain, a, you know, a guy from Northern Ireland. And we just like hang out together. And I was like, you know, where are you going to get that anywhere else? You know, and, and um, so that's why I basically... Um, transferred my credits and didn't, then had that kind of word world perspective shift where your whole perspective opens up and you just realize the U S is not the center of the universe. There's lots of other diverse perspectives out there, that kind of thing. Yeah. It is a bit of an epiphany I'd say in many ways. And I think as travelers, we can get spoil getting used to being surrounded by this international crowd and after you've been doing it for a while there's something about the first not moments but the first time in that in life where it's happening and you're really opening up and it's it's kind of a mind explosion in many ways <laughs> right i guess you if you live in norway and you know you probably had that too if you, you know the beginnings of when you moved there yeah but i think for me it was the first solo trip i took abroad to europe the first proper solo trip the the spring break trip to cancun when i was in high school does not count (laughs) (laughs) there wasn't much cultural exchange going on at senior frogs or whatever (laughs) it's like when you have to learn how to navigate someplace or you know pay a bill in a foreign country um standing in line at the post office kind of thing that um then you realize how different the world is and yeah well, what does a personal trip look like for you? Because I know you must travel a lot for work. Of course, we're, we are going to get into this list and we have a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today, but got to take a little time to get to know you. I should officially say, Amy Olipia, welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. I haven't officially welcomed you oh, yet. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for inviting. Yeah, I'm just curious about your, your personal travel style because work trips are one thing, but then when you want to take off to kind of have your own travel experience what does that look like for you right now right now well I well it, I guess it always I just really like wandering so and I'm the type of person who just really loves traveling anywhere it could be it doesn't have to be any place glamorous or that uh, like a travel magazine has ever wrote about because there's always something interesting in the world I feel like you just park yourself somewhere um, doesn't have to be fancy and just observe. And that is really kind of what I love the most is like seeing how other people live. Like I wish my superpower was, you know, the ability to be invisible and you could just like hang out in people's houses. <laughs> so I know which sounds creepy, but no, I mean, I just love to like see just how other people live in other cultures. So it's like whether I'm going to go to the grocery store, you know, you know, the local whatever drug store, see how people, you know, what people are buying, what are on the shelves, what people are watching in the movie theaters, what cars they drive. So I'm really actually a very easy traveler. I don't need a lot. I just need to be kind of wandering around um, to just observing, wondering how people live. Well, that's part of the job too, right? As a writer or journalist, you have to observe. So I'm sure it helps to kind of enjoy that just on a personal level (laughs) to enjoy that role. Because right. that's, and it's actually kind of hard to be like my travel companion because, you know, they're like, this, what's so interesting about this place? And I'll be like, this is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, that can be a, a struggle, I think, when you are... <sighs> You've been with National Geographic for over 20 years now, correct? Yes. Yeah. That's incredible. Level player, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, you're kind of... We would say trained or you've been doing it for so long that you, you probably see stories everywhere in a lot of things, you know, story angles, potential things. Is it hard to kind of get the off switch going when you travel for, for personal reasons? Yeah, Yeah, it actually kind of is. You're always just because I also just personally, you know, journal. And so I'm always, I'm always thinking of what the story is or like the overhearing conversations and writing down like cool things people say, like quotes. <laughs> I'm getting to sound really creepy, aren't I? No, but no, not at all, because that's... Well, when you write it down, you remember it. Right, exactly. That's the thing. I mean, I have to write down, or I will forget. I have, like, very bad memory. 
I'm always amazed when I read somebody's memoir how much they I'm like, can you really is you know, I would have to have a huge disclaimer if I ever wrote a memoir. Like probably ninety eight percent of this is wrong and definitely ninety nine percent of the dialogue, but you know, you get the general gist. Right. Artistic license. <laughs> Artistic know? license, yes. Wow. Well, I mean, in travel media, I guess you it, with journalism, there's not as much artistic license, I suppose, when it comes to the facts and 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 that sort of thing. I well, I have some questions about travel media, and I want to get your advice on on various things before we get into the list, if that's okay. Uh, I, just in terms of your career, I'm wondering what are some of the personal highlights for you so far? Career? Um, oh, I had a career high recently because I interviewed Dolly Parton. Saw that. Yeah. It was like the most (laughs) awesome thing ever. And like, she's a wonder. And she actually, during the interview, she gave me a little kind of mini concert, just a private mini concert because she was answering a question, but then she basically sang the song she was referring to, like a, like a, you know, bit of the the song. Um, So I was like, I almost actually kind of wept. (laughs) It was like, oh my God. Um, So that's one. Um, you know, and, and just working with amazing authors and getting to see their work um, up after we have worked on for something for so long. Um, and sometimes, you know, it gets acknowledged by the wider industry. Um, we um, won a, an ASME Award, which is the, you know, American Society Magazine Editor Award for a piece we did that was um, really different because it was um, illustrated. It was by Christoph Neiman. And, um, you know, it was uh, about a trip down the Mekong and he had illustrated it, but we worked on him to make, you know, so it was an actual travel narrative and it was just so clever. And um, I just thought, you know, moments like this where you can work with such talented people is just totally worth it. Hmm. I did see a clip from the Dolly Parton interview because she's one of my songwriting heroes. Really? And I saw yeah. the moment because I have my Tennessee Mountain Home was the... <sighs> little yeah. thing that she sung. I have that on one of my playlists and I hear it. So I hear it quite often. And I was thinking about you in the room there and I was putting myself in your shoes and thinking that must have been incredible. Yeah. That's something you'll remember for the rest of your life. Yeah, totally. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I was getting chills when you were just describing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because it's like, how often do you get to sit across from Dolly Parton and have her sing something to you, right? Basically. One time, apparently, I yeah. guess. <laughs> Maybe we can get her on the show. Dolly, if you're listening. <laughs> and she just won like $100 million. Did you see that? Yeah. Um, from Jeff Bezos. For well her deserved. For her work, yeah. Well deserved. Definitely. Was travel a thing for you early on in your life with your parents or growing up? I'm just wondering where the interest came. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I'm just one of those kind of very fortunate kids who's parents love to travel as well. And my parents are from the Philippines. So like every other summer when I was a kid, we would go back to the Philippines to um, visit relatives. So along the way, we would stop at various places. So one time we'd stop at like Singapore or Hong Kong or, you know, Egypt or Greece. So um, definitely the travel bug started really early. Hmm. And was there a particular trip that was more transformative for you than others growing up was just reconnecting with yeah I guess what was it like connecting with your parents homeland where they came from as a child well, it was, yeah well it was great because it was basically like your house but as a country you know it's like you know what I mean I don't even know how to explain it but everyone you know looks like you they're speaking your parents language so it felt it felt like home in some ways, um, although of course it also felt very different because the Philippines is so so different, and it was also eye opening because it was my first time being in a place where you know that they call third world, where people did not have um, as many advantages as where I was growing up. So that was an eye opener, um, seeing kids on the street selling um, you know gum from car to car, that just kind of opens your eyes. Yeah, I can't not. And I have two small kids right and now. They're four and six. And that was that is one of the main reasons I want to do some traveling with them like that as they get a little older, just kind of see these things and, and let it let it speak for itself. 
Right, exactly. Right? I mean, you just realize how privileged you are. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I wanted to get your advice on a few things because a huge part of your job, I imagine, is curation. You have a world of things to choose from, literally. You have to take the best stuff as a, as a senior editor out of uh, a ton of options. And when you add in the fact that it's a media institution like National Geographic, uh, which has been around since the late 1800s, I imagine you have to be pretty good at curating. So I'm wanting to get your advice on curation. First of all, do you think that's like, is that a skill that one can develop? Yes. And I think it helps to be at a place like Natchea where you have like guiding missions that have been stated from like the 1880s, basically, where, you know, at Natchea, it's illuminating, you know, the world and so that you care about the planet, basically. So that's really the, the North Star that I go by when we decide what kind of stories to do. Um, so we're looking at places that you know, awe and inspire you and told in a way like the story has to be told in a way that, um, you know, inspires you to do something to help you preserve the planet and, you know, um, do something after you've read it, you know. Mm. The process of curation, what does that look like for you? We can use the, the list as an example, but you could, I'm sure there's a process that you go through with the pieces that you publish. I'm just curious how that how that works internally. Yeah, actually, the list is a really good good way we have been using because you know it's divided into these five categories: adventure, history, culture, uh, family, nature, and this year community. And all those are like five pillars of Natchio, really. And so, if um, a destination we could slot it into one of those categories, and then plus it's superlative, it's timely there's an interesting story we can tell about it, then that's like a green light for that, you know, uh, place in that story idea. Hmm. How do you construct a, a narrative and a, a great story? This would just be advice for other people listening for themselves, for their personal journal or writers out there. And I think storytelling is such a important part of life in general. So you don't necessarily have to be a writer, but I would love to hear with all of your experience, some of the advice you would have around telling a good story, doing a story justice, anything around storytelling. Well, I always tell people that um, you have to kind of follow your passion and that, you know, okay, whether it's like, uh, you know, desserts, I love desserts. So like, what is the story that only you can tell me because you love desserts about some place. So you maybe, you know, it's about the person at this Norwegian bakery who makes your favorite dessert. Um, and here's the history behind the dessert. And um, here's some experts talking about how hard it is to make this, the craftsmanship of it, you know, so it's like taking things that you love to do. So you'll be asking the questions that are deeper than just you know, any surface or anything that, you know, you don't know about, but if you have an interest in something and almost like an expertise, because you know what the, the rest of the field or the industry is like, or that topic is like, then you'll ask questions that go beyond the, um, the usual. And that will surface up, you know, some cool story that only you could have told me for one thing. Um, and that has your insight and your expertise in it as well. Is it hard to let somebody down when they come to you super excited about a story that this is going to be incredible, Amy? I've got a great angle on this. And you're like, eh, not, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> is that a tough part of the job? Um, no, it's always hard. I always try to like soften the blow by saying, you know, well, this isn't going to work, but, um, but always happy to get your other ideas because you never know. And that's true. I mean, you never know. Maybe that there's that one other story that you can tell me that I'm going to totally love. What are the tough parts of the job? I think dealing with the um, just the amount of <laughs> email I get. Seriously, like my inbox is something like 14,000 unread emails. And, um, you know, some of that is, of course, spam. But, a lot, you know, you want to kind of read because you never know if there's that great writer, that new writer that you is going to be the next great person in that in your inbox. So you kind of feel bad that you're not looking at your 14,000 emails. 
Um, that's really kind of the hardest thing. But, you know, it's travel narrative and it's something I, you know, don't tell my boss this. I would probably do um, for free. Yeah. I like went, reading I travel anything. stories, thinking about travel all day. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. I've said that a few times and I always say, don't tell the people that are sponsoring the show. <laughs> <laughs> the pitches. I think my listeners would absolutely go ballistic on me if I didn't ask you what makes a killer pitch or what does a killer pitch look like? Because this is a national geographic two words. Everybody knows you love travel writing or travel photography, anything with travel you want to be featured in national geographic. It's a, it's sort of the, the gold standard, right? In many ways. So if you could uh, give some people advice here and everybody listening, know that there are 14,000 emails in front of you. <laughs> So, <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can imagine, I think what what is really important right at the top is like if you're sending an email is to make sure the subject line is really grabby, like something that you would click on in your day of scrolling. So just think like of all the stuff you're scrolling through today, of all the stuff you can consume on podcasts or on your Twitter feed or your face Instagram feed or, you know, listening um, to or watching on TV, what is going to make you stop? and read that story, you know? And so that, whatever that language is has to be in the subject line of the email. Cause that will make me go, Oh, okay. I'll click on that and see what you're talking about. And then of course it's the starting right away in your pitch with what like the, the first sentence of the story might be. So it's not, don't tell me I am, I love traveling as your first sentence. It needs to be the first sentence that grabs me. And then you could explain yourself later on down in the um, pitch or in the email. Um, but the first like two sentences need to be what's going to grab me about the story right away. And, um, and then basically kind of outline what the story is, but very briefly and in the style that's your style. And I feel like this is really important. Like your voice is so important. And people um, often pitch us with an email that has their voice in it. Um, and then when they hand in the story, that it, it sounds totally different because they feel like maybe they have to write in a National Geographic voice. You know what I mean? And um, and so it's not at all like what we had greenlighted in their pitch. And so I often have to tell writers, you know, what happened to that great voice that you had in your pitch. Um, and it's kind of got tamped down or made really bland because of this other way you've decided to write your story. So um, I think having a very specific point of view and a voice, and of course, just being very, like having all your facts right and well-researched and reported, you know, quotes in a pitch are really good. That that shows me that you had done a little work already and that you have experts that you could um, go to to get um, insight on. And also it, for Nat Geo, of course, photo photography is really important. So um, an indication of what the visual story that could be told is like a bonus and a really good bonus. Because if you can say like, there's a variety of image that we could get from this to this, then... Um, that shows also that you realize how important visuals are at Nat Geo. Great advice. Thank you. Can you think of a headline that caught your attention recently, a specific example? Okay. So yeah, there was one about the Hungarian blood countess, you know, political pawn or serial killer. And that was the subject line, right? And I'm like, click. You got to click on that. that. About? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hungarian blood countess, serial killer or political pod. Yeah. So it had all these great keywords in its um, subject line. And we actually, we ended up using that almost word for word in the actual headline. So um, yeah, I mean, that helps us as well when you have a subject line that's almost actually the clickable headline. Um, that's also a bonus. But not clickbaity, right? Not clickbaity. This is a, a fine right. line. Between, exactly. Yeah. Right. I mean, because you want this, because otherwise that annoys you, right? If you click on something, it had nothing to do with the blood countess. But if it actually is a very cool story about the history of it, um, what you can see of this history as a traveler, um, then, you know, that's a win. Hmm. You mentioned somebody's distinct voice 
And I'm curious, finding your voice as an individual, have you ever reflected on that journey for you? I think everybody that is practicing a craft, like writing or editing is a craft, all these things, podcasting, whatever it is, it's, you go on a bit of a journey to find your voice and it's not always easy. What did that journey look like for you? I mean, I think that's really the hardest journey of all because of all the other things about writing, you can almost, you know, those are tools you can pick up in a journalism class, journalism school, you know, the tools about how to interview um, well, how to cultivate sources. Um, those are things you can can learn. But I feel like the journey of voice is like really the hardest journey any writer can have. And because it does involve, um, you know, sitting with yourself and kind of stripping away all the stuff you read, all the people who have influenced you in your writing and, um, and finding what's authentic to you. And, you know, that's hard. And um, I think the thing though, with, with writing for um, writing for publication compared to like writing for your journal. So you do have your journal authentic voice, um, but for, um, for publication, you also have to temper your, your voice with, with, you know, being clear and um, conveying your idea. So um, that makes it like the, the, the work of that more difficult in some ways. We'll get back to the interview in just a moment. Here's how you can finally make your bucket list vacation a reality. Travel lovers meet the U.S. Bank Altitude Connect Visa Signature Card. With this credit card, you'll get four times points on travel, including gas and EV charging stations, and five times points on prepaid hotels and car rentals when you book directly through the Altitude Rewards Center. And no matter where in the world you are, you'll get two times points on groceries, dining, and streaming with a $30 annual credit for streaming services, too. Visit usbank.com slash altitudeconnect to apply and learn how you can earn 50,000 bonus points. You deserve a credit card with more and more travel rewards. Apply to become an Altitude Connect card holder at usbank.com slash Altitude Connect. Limited time offer. The creditor and issuer of this card is U.S. Bank National Association pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc. Some restrictions may apply. Now, back to the show. One of the hardest parts, I think, is, I guess, producing work that isn't so hot, let's say. <laughs> that is a part of the the process of finding your voice, right? Some of it might be cribbing somebody's style, either maybe inadvertently or just somebody that you admire and, and you see a, a format or, or some kind of a template and you think it's cool and you try to use it in your own way, of course. And But maybe it ends up too much like them. And then there's the other side of just creating things that you may not be so proud of later or that shouldn't see the light of day for whatever reason. But at the same time, if you don't do all that, you can't get to the good stuff. Yeah. I think you should be okay with that to sit with like your younger voice self and stuff you read when you're younger. I, I think you can be okay with that. Do you think, or? Yeah, I, I do. I think it's, I think it's really important to give yourself permission to suck. Is what I say. Because you can never put anything out there or do anything creatively if you don't just make stuff. And it can't all be good. It just can't. As much as you want it to be. So if you hold yourself to a, a high standard, it, it's good. But there's a fine line between that and being a perfectionist. Well, how do you balance that in your job? Because that's, that's another tricky part of it, right? You have to kind of choose the the right things or the things that you think are right. You're a tastemaker in some ways as an editor. I'm sure it's a little bit overwhelming at times <laughs> to kind of toe the line between when something is done and when you need to send somebody back and say, do a little more work. Right. Well, that really is the difference between like the writing job and the editing job. And I feel like as, as a writer, you do the writing first and that's like, well, your voice getting on the, on the page and just having all your kind of knowledge and emotion. And then at the editing stage and what an editor can help you with, and of course you can edit yourself before you send it to an editor, is that the pruning and the manicuring that goes on. But I think the first drafts have to be just all your passion and your knowledge and your what you want to say. Like don't think about, oh, is this the right word to use? Am I repeating the same words all the time? Because the editor can do that. 
the editor will help you see that. And so that's why um, editors are really important because they do help you see like your work in from an outside point of view. And um, that's super helpful. And, and you don't have to do that. That's what editors are for. They help you to, you know, note that, you know, you're, you're doing this here where you're, you're constantly repeating or, you know, or it's like you're viewing these people, you're saying these people as other and let's not do that. So um, editors help you do that the leadership position you have as senior editor, it's, I, I guess I wanted to ask you what you, what you've learned about leadership. And I, I think the distinction I want to make here is that the leadership that you are providing is, is amongst a, an, a creative environment. Maybe it's a bit different than leading a sales team. The leader of a sales team might, might be more numbers driven. There's certain other aspects of leadership that might come into play, but when it comes to creativity writing it maybe it's a bit of a different game maybe i'm wrong there is people get invested emotionally in a piece their soul may be invested in some ways you know you know how it is you create something and you get really emotionally invested in it yeah, so it's like your baby yeah what is your advice i guess just around leadership i think it's to always kind of hold yourself to a standard of excellence because you know, it's easy when you're working at your desk and just by yourself to, um, I guess, just let things go in some way. But um, editors, especially, we have to just make, you know, the commas in the right place. The word choices are the best words you can use. You're not using cliches. You are reaching for that, I don't know, that ephemeral Miss that comes from great writing. That's really kind of the job of leadership, at least in, in this, in my particular field, is, um, is trying to hold people to that level of excellence, you know, and not go for the easy words or the easy descriptions or the easy story. Let's dig deeper. Let's find, let's ask the questions that no one else is asking, um, that kind of thing. Travel media and media in general has changed a lot over the years, to say the least. What excites you about travel media nowadays? Oh my gosh, what's really exciting, which I, you know, is, you know, in the past couple of years is just the, the the different voices that have come, had that we have been surfacing and highlighting and um, people just being interested in hearing other voices, really. Because, you know, sometimes you just hear the same narratives about a place um, over and over again. And you're like, really, there's nothing more to say. And what the past couple of years have shown that, you know, there's so many interesting voices that are diverse and that reveal stories about a place that you did not know. And so it gives you this totally new, fresh look at a destination that you thought you knew, but here's a new voice that you didn't. So I just, I'm really excited about that. That will be something I think that comes up when we get into the list here. I'm thinking of, of one specific example, because in the real world, not, not just in the digital media world, but... Uh, you see that happening too with destinations and what they're prioritizing and museums that are being created and, and things that frankly should have been created a long time ago, but uh, better late than never. Well, along those lines, what, what do you see as the responsibilities of travel media? Um, well, here at Nat Geo, we are, of course, always wanting to direct people to how to travel responsibly and just mindfully. Um, and of course, that's both an interior um, journey and exterior thing because you know interior is like well am I taking care of myself like spa retreats or forest therapy or you know hot springs or and and the exterior of that is are you traveling um, to places where you know your money um, is going back to the community in some way or to to sustain ecosystems in some way um, am I making sure my footprint when I travel is has less of an impact. So um, I think that's really our responsibility is to give people tools and ideas and, and thoughts about how to, to travel the world in a way that is mindful. Have you ever measured the impact of travel media or what you do at National Geographic on travel itself? For example, the destinations we talk about today, 
Will they see a major spike in visitors because they were included on this list in, in the real world? I think so. I mean, anecdotally, I don't can't recall like any numbers, but for, you know, for example, Milwaukee, we have that on our list this year and like yeah, they that. have it on you know, kind of billboards kind of thing. Sure. <laughs> um, so I don't could, um, I guess. I, I don't have the numbers exactly, but I would think it would. Although I would hope it wouldn't be like a, a like a deluge that it would ruin a place. Of course. <laughs> right. Yeah. Then it's a back to the over tourism question, right? But I think you did a great job curating this list. Uh, yeah. When I saw Milwaukee, that was. I thought it was cool that you included something from the Midwest like that. And I imagine that was a big deal for the city of Milwaukee to be acknowledged in that way. The categories you mentioned in the list, first of all, how many people see this list in your, in your estimate? Well, you know, it's an international list. So, you know, we have something like 11 international editions and all those editorial teams helped in the shaping of this list. And so, and then all of them launch the list at the, basically the same time. So it's all their readership plus millions. all our readership. Yeah. So it's probably, you know, millions. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure, Amy. Yeah, no. Don't no pressure to nail it. But, you know, I would say global. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. But, you know, our readership times 11. Um, yeah. But, wow. I just bring that up because... We do a lot of fun lists on the show, and a lot of it's you know subjective. Here I am with my pen and paper writing out a list of my five favorite this or that. But this is this is not going out to tens of millions or maybe hundreds of millions of people. I don't know, like like the one that you put together. So I think it's really cool to kind of go over some of these. And of course, we can't cover all twenty five must see destinations for the new year. But we can cover five of them. So I asked you to pick five of your faves, one from each category. Of course, the categories you mentioned again, family, adventure, culture, nature. And it sounds like community is a new one. I'm just curious why you guys chose to include that as a category. And then we'll get into some of your picks. Yeah, community is really kind of an expansion of um, a, a category we always do, which is more around like sustainability. And this year, we just wanted to acknowledge that there are communities that isn't just about, you know, not using single use plastics, but it's about looking at the way communities um, have had successes around, um, you know, how they view tourism to filter back to, to, to benefit their communities or their ecosystems. So that's why we just kind of broaden the topic, although we have always have this type of topic. And of course, this theme is something that goes through an entire list. They are entire list and actually through all of what we do at Nat Geo Travel is just this idea of, you know, how um, people are doing good, doing better in terms of destination stewardship. Do you want to kick this off? I'll let you pick the category in the first one. Was this hard for you to pick one of each? Yeah, it really is. So, because <laughs> yeah. so, they're all like, as you said, you know, they're my baby. This whole list is my baby, and like, even though I haven't been to all these places, you know, now my my bucket list is you know so much more. Had you know added like twenty more places. Um, I guess I could start with the nature category, the Azores, where I actually have been. Um, and that's this, the Azores are these it's archipelago in the Atlantic Ocean. And um, it's in our nature category because they have these um, amazing um, natural wonders there. And it's a volcanic archipelago and they have these thermal springs. And you can do things like um, when I was there, we um, had a meal where they cooked it kind of underground in like, you know, some kind of a pit, a hot pit because it was thermal. And, you know, then they come out, but it's like, you know, the meat was cooked, the vegetables were cooked. It's called Casido or um, something similar. And it's just also a great place for whale watching. And, um, and you know, it's, it's basically like four and a half hours from Boston on a direct flight. So it's actually easier, like the easiest way to get to Europe technically anywhere, you know. Um, and I'm glad this is on the list because I have been a fan um, of the place for a long time. 
what's great about the Azores too is that it feels like an end of the world type place. And I love, I'm fascinated by places like that. You know, like Antarctica is like the very top of my bucket list. And I've been to um, like the Marquesas, uh, which are part of French Polynesia. And all these places feel like they're in the middle of nowhere or feel like they're at the end of the world. And I really love, um, I'm fascinated by places like that. What is one of your favorite memories from that trip you took? To- In the Azores? Yeah. It really was like um, the, the eating the food that came out of the ground that was cooked by the earth, basically. Um, and But, you know, there's lots of beautiful things there. There's um, these, these dual lakes um, at the top of a mountain where one is like green and one is blue. And they're volcanic calderas. And um, I just thought that was like the most beautiful thing. Do you do a lot of hiking? I saw you did the hiking piece in Wales. Is that something you, know, you like to do? No, the secret is no, I actually do not. <laughs> um, you know, people think I, since I work at you know National Geographic, I'm like summiting Everest in my right. spare time. Um, and I don't, you know, I have three kids, so I actually don't do a lot of, um, it's more like visits to Chuck E. Cheese. But yeah, yeah um, I do whenever I get the chance or when I'm offered, I do, you know, try to hike. So yeah. I've, well, the, yeah. I mean- Let's face it, the Chuck E. Cheese experience is some kind of cultural experience. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'll go anywhere. <laughs> that, you know, the cool hiking thing you mentioned, um, one of the other things that's on the list is Choquequirao in Peru. That's on, on our adventure category. And um, the we wanted to highlight this because, you know, it's kind of a sister site to Machu Picchu. And I've been to Machu Picchu and I've hiked at Huayna Picchu. Um, which is that uh, mountain that's in the background of all the photos you have of Machu Picchu. And, um, and that was also not usual for me. I wouldn't usually climb like, that type of mountain. But yeah, it was amazing. I don't know if you've ever done it, but it's yeah totally worth it. You climb up these Inca steps to get to the top um, of Machu Picchu. But um, Choquequira, which is on our list this year, is um, also Inca, um, but so much more um, harder to reach. Um, you can only get there by hiking right now. Um, and it's just definitely more remote. And so highlighting it was a way for us to show, you know, Machu Picchu is kind of being loved to death. Um, and here's a place, um, that has similar amazing things about it. Um, and is much, much less visited. Yeah. I'm in the article, you said pre pandemic Machu Picchu had more than a million and a half visitors annually, according to Peruvian tourism officials. And the site counted less than 9,500. That's an incredible difference. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's because it's so hard to reach right now. You just kind of have to trip up in the clouds kind of thing. Mm. And yeah. I guess because you chose that, it's now on your bucket list as it is on mine. Because I've done Machu Picchu and that was spectacular. I was there in the early 2000s, but it's time for a another visit, this sounds like the perfect place to go. I know. And I feel like you know, Machu Picchu gets a lot of um, like ink. And so you have a, a lot of precursors and you think, is it going to be disappointing? And you get there and it's not. I mean, it's so breathtaking being there like on the edge of, the, of a mountain and feeling like you could just like step off into the clouds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, I find that those places that get all of the hype that exists for a reason. I don't think I've been to a place like that and just been like, eh. I really know. (laughs) Pictures can never do it justice. Okay. Want to go to the family category? You mentioned having three kids. I imagine you were heavily invested in in the family category. How old are your kids, by the way? I have three kids. So 16, 13, and 10. And um, we were actually just there with my youngest one um, in San Francisco this past summer. And what we liked about San Francisco was kind of their reimagining of their outdoor space. Um, They have this new crosstown trail, which goes diagonally across the city. And it um, is an urban trail. So it kind of teaches kids and families that you don't have to be out and remote and, you know, somewhere really far to have a hiking experience. Um, It could, you know, the great trail is, you know, as close as your nearest basketball court kind of thing. Um, And then also they, when we were there, we visited the Presidio Tunnel Tops, which just opened this past summer. And um, it's a reclaiming of space above the, basically the tunnel tops that, you know, 
highway tunnels. Um, and they made it into this amazing kind of playground with um, no plastic, like a no plastic playground. There's um, a campfire, there's a nature center, and um, it has like the most amazing view of the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm, sounds and the thing about I know, right? And the thing about um, kids traveling with kids is that they don't need a whole lot. And because when we were at, for example, on this tunnel tops, my kid really loved like these these wobbly red chairs. And, you know, so they don't need a whole lot. And and traveling with them really lets you see things with new eyes. And um, they're just entertained by the oddest things. And they have, like, very simple needs. Like, they want to try out the mochi donuts in Japantown or, um, you know, that kind of thing. Or see the seals at, um, you know, Pier 39. And some things that adults might be cynical about or overlook, you know. And um, they, like, they really appreciate it. So walking around with them somewhere just um, gives you um, new perspective on things. Have you traveled a lot with them? I do try. I do. I do always try to take them with me, especially because like having three and if I travel, you know, without them, they get mad. And my husband also gets mad yeah. <laughs> because, like, at home with three kids. It is a lot of work. <laughs> I guess you travel a lot for work is the assumption, but is that the truth? I'm um, not it- as much as you think, actually. I always tell people that because, like, you know, who's putting out the magazine if we're traveling all the time? So, yeah, definitely not as much as you think. There's the perception of some of these jobs and the reality of it, right? So you must be climbing Everest and just traveling around the world all the time. Oh, well. <laughs> Nothing would get done. <laughs> Let's move into the history slash culture category. One thing that I thought was really interesting about this list this year was having Charleston on it because Charleston, you know, for a long, is one of those places that you just hear the same things. Like the stories we get about Charleston are all the same. It's like low country cuisine. um, It's beautiful architecture. I mean, and all this stuff is amazing. And of course is very, is what makes Charleston a great, a great destination. But here, with the opening this next year of the International um, African American Museum is um, a way that Charleston is kind of leaning into different narratives. And I think, you know, they're still figuring out how to tell um, the Black history after, you know, centuries of suppression. And I think this is one um, indication of the work that they're doing around it. And because as um, you might know, Charleston, I think about 40% of enslaved Africans came into North America, uh, passing through Charleston's Harbor. And, um, uh, you know, and some 90% of um, all African Americans can trace at least one ancestor to this area, historians say. So um, leaning into this narrative and exploring it and and the fact that it's, you know, tragic and traumatic, um, we thought was something interesting to highlight, definitely. And also the fact that it's, you know, it's a place where it also shares moments of, you know, triumph and resilience and um, joy as well. Like one thing you can do at this new museum is they have like a genealogy center where you can, uh, they have like millions of genealogical records and you can trace your family trees there. The inclusion of this is really in line with what you talked about earlier with travel media and the the narratives and really those new voices being heard or or, or not new or people being receptive to hearing some more of these voices. Right. Like like a spotlighting history that the hidden figures that were were never highlighted before. In many ways, history has been misrepresented, of course. It's so important. So having this uh, as a, a part of it for the reason that, uh, as you said in the in the article, Black history is being told through a new lens, which I, I just love that. We got one more category, community. Going back to your college country. Right. For this one, yeah. right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I'd want to highlight Alberta, Canada, which is on the list. Um, similar to... Um, to Charleston because of their leadership in indigenous tourism. They, of course, Alberta is also one of those places where you know it for like Banff National Park or the Athabasca Glacier or the Rocky Mountains or like Calgary Stampede. But um, recently there's been um, 
this broader trend throughout North America of rethinking how indigenous stories are told, where indigenous peoples are claiming that right to tell their own stories so that, um, you know, they're not telling it as if, you know, Native people are in the past, uh, which is often like the narrative that gets told about Indigenous peoples that, you know, it's something in the past, it's like this century, but um, them telling themselves, like, okay, we're here, we have a vibrant contemporary culture, we have triumphs and challenges like every other community, and here's what you can learn um, from us about where we live um, and the places that we steward after, you know, centuries. And, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of that, not just in travel media and in travelers, but, you know, like Reservation Dogs, for example, that series on Hulu, excellent series, or, you know, the one of the award-winning novels the past couple of years was the, the novel There, There by Tommy Orange, which is about, you know, urban Native people in Oakland, California. So it's just, you know, here's another, as, you know, going back to the whole thing about here's another perspective, it's told by the people themselves. And Alberta, um, it leads into that. Thank you so much for sharing your picks and for taking the time to share everything you did today. The list, of course, we'll link to it in the show notes. Plenty of bucket list fodder, as we mentioned. (laughs) These lists are like a blessing and a curse. (laughs) (laughs) For the travel lover. So to go to now, I know. (laughs) Were there any that you were really fighting for that didn't make the cut? If you had to add a 26th or a 27th, what would it be? Oh my God, that is such a good question. There was like so many. Oh my God, and I'm sorry, I probably can't remember one. I'm sorry. I can't. okay. Went off the top of my head. <laughs> Your head's probably swimming with destinations after this, so it's totally yeah. understandable. Oh my God. Can I like call you after and let yes. you know? And like you can add it on at the end of this podcast because I'm just going to go look at our list because you know our, we have hundreds and. Yes, I, I my inbox is backed up too, but I will always open an email from National <laughs> Geographic. On that note, I will ask you: uh, How does one collaborate with National Geographic? I'm just asking for a friend. Um, feel free to like email me, um, tweet at me. Shameless self promotion here. No, I'm kidding. I'm always happy to get used to it. <laughs> I really appreciate your time today and uh, just getting the advice on some of the other stuff you provided, of course, you know, writing and storytelling and curating and all the other stuff we talked about. I will link up to the list, of course, in the show notes. Is there anything else you, you want to share here or you want to send people to? Yeah, well, um, explore our list, natgeotravel.com. Um, lots of good info there. What are you working on next? Are you allowed to say? Oh, well, well we're working on, um, uh, I'm working on a feature for Natio Magazine right now on Apostle Islands, nice. which is Lake Superior. So excited for that one. immersed in that. So that's where my head is right now. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for taking time out of the day today and hopefully we can keep in touch. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Take care. There you have it. Special thanks to Amy Olipio from National Geographic for stopping by, sharing her story, sharing her advice on pitching them. That was super valuable and sharing her list which was inspiring to me. Hope you were inspired as well. I have to say I was a bit giddy, a bit uh, had those warm fuzzies when I I got in touch with Nat Geo and we decided to do an episode together and coming into the 10th year of the show, now officially, I couldn't have imagined something like this happening (laughs) when I started the show. I'm going to talk a little bit about the beginning of the show. If you're curious, you want to hear a little bit about the early times I've got a few distinct memories I want to share. First, I do want to give a shout out to a listener who's gearing up for a big trip and had some nice words to say about you and about the community here. Give this a quick listen. My name is Zach. I uh, I messaged you over the summer about rafting when you were in Colorado. Uh, I just wanted to touch base real quick. Uh, you know, I'm catching the last bits of a beautiful... Colorado sunset right now had about 200 birds fly over me on the front range because it's that time of the year. It's absolutely stunning. Um, Colorado misses you for sure. 
Uh, point being, I am getting ready to do quite a bit of travel uh, over in Nepal for about three months. Um, and your show has been absolutely instrumental in making that happen. Uh, I'm currently listening to your audio tour uh, that you and your wife did of Nepal, which is perfect. That timing was incredible that I found those um, at the same time I'm planning this. Uh, so you and this amazing community that you have built and are part of, um, yeah, please don't stop. You're encouraging people to do things they love. You're encouraging me to do things I love. Thank you so much for the kind words, Zach. Congratulations on the big trip to Nepal. And that's the part I wanted to hit on right at the end here when he said, this is about encouraging people to do what they love. That's what this community is about. That's what the show is really about when it comes down to it. I hadn't really thought of it in exactly that phrasing, which is why I wanted to share this voicemail because I think coming into the 10th year, that is a good reminder for all of us and for myself here to keep going, to keep encouraging each other, to do the things we love. I just want to say a massive thank you to you. Yes, you listening right now because without the community here, there isn't anything. It's the wisdom of the guests. It's the stories from the community like Zach's. That's what continues to inspire me to push the show forward, to push everything forward, and really encourages me to continue to do what I love, which is to help people travel, to talk about travel, and to help others live their travel dreams, to really work together, to do what we can do to live our best lives each and every day. And honestly, that takes work. That takes work for me. I know. I don't get up every day with uh, the most positive attitude like anybody you know sometimes you go through things there's ups and downs and of course entering the 10th year here of the podcast there have been a lot of ups and downs in life in work in a lot of things 10 years ago uh, things are a bit fuzzy <laughs> of course but some things I distinctly remember I remember sitting on my couch for about 45 minutes in Colorado with a pen and paper and writing out the intro to this show and the concept for the show and setting this crazy goal to inspire a million people to travel the world, which seemed insane. Now the show has had over 10 million downloads, which is totally mind blowing. And early on, I didn't even know if anybody would listen to it. I remember the first horrible take of the show. I had all the wrong equipment. I was screaming into the mic like I was an MC for some kind of bad spring break contest or something. And I didn't know what I was doing, like anybody who starts something. And I remember eventually leaving Colorado, going back into nomad mode. I'd like rented out my place. I was driving across the country, visiting some friends, and then recording those early episodes in spare bedrooms. Actually, for quite a long time, I remember visiting my mom before I went back to visit my now wife in Norway and recording some episodes in the bedroom there, hunched over, not really knowing what I was doing, just talking to these amazing people and really having these conversations that I'd love to have when I was traveling or when I am traveling at hostels or wherever you meet people, other travelers, learning from them. And this idea of being able to just have those types of conversations and share the knowledge, share the knowledge I wish I had when I was starting out, when I had $20,000 in debt, I didn't really understand how people could travel and see the world. And I just had this dream and having gotten to have the good fortune to be nomadic for over 10 years and to travel and to learn and to make travel such a huge part of my life, I really wanted to find a way to give back, to help others do the things that I was fortunate to do just because I had uh, some experience, but also help along the way and advice from others who I encountered and interacted with, taught me some different things. I learned about some different things uh, along the way, like you do when you're trying to figure something out. And it's just life. We're always trying to figure out life, right? And I thought, hey, these conversations, there's a lot of people out there with wisdom and knowledge. I would love to chat with some of them and just share it with people. Maybe it'll help people out. And it turns out that it not only has been something that has really fulfilled my personal life, but it has been something, judging from the emails and some of the messages I've gotten over the years, that has helped inspire other people to get out there and travel and given them the practical tools as well. And I think just the motivation and the knowledge that, hey, there is a whole group of people out there 
either doing this or working towards it. And sometimes just hearing those stories really helps validate our own decisions, helps us kind of stay strong and keep doing the things we want to do. And like I said before, just living our best life, which I think takes work. At least it does for me. And to be honest with you, there has been a couple times when I've been ready to throw in the towel because it is a lot of work. Never have I ever remember that game. Never have I ever (laughs) done something so consistently for so long and the same project. This is the by far the longest, most consistent thing I've done. And a couple times I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up because it was and is a ton of work. And I can think of two times when I seriously considered it because I was just a little burnt out tired, whatever the reason was. And both of those times, I got a message within 20 minutes of having that thought, I would say, maybe sooner, that would literally contain the phrasing, don't stop doing this. (laughs) And I was like, okay, well, somebody's telling me something here. So let's keep this thing going. And the truth is I get so much joy out of this show and this community. And when I get to hear stories from you all, like Zach, don't get me teary now. I'm not going to, not going to tear up here. Save that for later. (laughs) But it's the messages from the community, the stories from the community that have kept this thing going for so long. It's you. It's you being here, listening, being a part of this. That's the only reason this is still here. And I get so much personal fulfillment out of, doing the show and having this as a part of my life, getting to have these conversations and to learn from others much smarter and wiser than myself just through these conversations, then getting to share that and have others in the community hopefully benefit from these conversations as well, doing my best to just facilitate conversations and provide value to you as a listener. And I have no plans of stopping 10th year here. Can't believe it. Um, More excited than ever to bring you the show. And I have a request. If you have never gotten in touch or you've never interacted with the show in some way, there are a few different ways you can do it. You can leave a review, of course. Those are always nice to get. Help get the show out to more people. Uh, guest recommendation. If you want to send me an email, you can always get in touch, recommend a guest or a topic. You can leave me a voicemail. I have a link to that on the show notes. Very easy. Just click a button and leave a voicemail. Or you can go further. I've done things before like having guest hosts. It's been a while. If you have some ideas for a show or some existing audio content, this is a community powered show. I truly mean that when I say it. And If there's anybody out there listening that thinks they have something that can benefit the community, I'm totally down for whatever. Down to experiment, down to have some fun here in our 10th year and beyond. And I really look forward to sharing this time with you. So thank you so very much. Just want to say a massive, massive thank you. I've got so much gratitude for you and your presence here. I will leave you with a quote from Stephen King pretty much nailed it. He said, don't let the sun go down without saying thank you to someone and without admitting to yourself that absolutely no one gets this far alone. So grateful for your time today. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next week. Peace and love to you and yours. This podcast has been brought to you by ZeroToTravel.com. Ideas and advice to make your travel dreams a reality.